I was, if you will, born again about an hour from here, two hours with traffic, at uh, your rival, Stanford University. It was 1998. I was 22, 23 years old. I was on a road trip with uh, my best friend, Kevin Koval, who's here tonight. And we were going to this interfaith conference called the United Religions Initiative. We were activists with our hair on fire, and we were going looking for the new generation of Malcolm X's and Thich Nhat Hans and Dorothy Day's and Abraham Joshua Heschel's and Martin Luther King Jr.'s, the great faith heroes of earlier eras. We had this image that at this interfaith conference, the new generation would all be gathered and they would be engaging with this vanguard energy for a new world. When we show up, we're there for two days, and it's basically panels with senior theologians talking. And on day two, I just I couldn't take it anymore. And I stood up, and I threw my fist in the air, and I called these folks out. I was like, you are boring. Really boring. Where's the vanguard energy? Where's the edge? Where's the social action? Where are the young people? Where's like... Thich Nhat Hanh and Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr., that's what I thought I was coming to, right? Interfaith work cannot just be about senior theologians talking. It has to be about young people acting. And this was not my first activist rodeo, right? So I knew what was going to follow from this. There were going to be a, a few gasps, a little pearl clutching, and a smattering of applause. And I was, like, looking for that. But something kind of surprising happened after a few minutes. You know, folks scattered, they were off to the next session. I'd gotten the reaction that I wanted. But kind of out of nowhere, this woman approaches me. An indigenous Mayan woman is how she introduces herself. Her name is Yolan Trevino. And she says, you know, what you just said about interfaith work, needing to have like more vanguard energy, like more edge, should be more about young people acting than senior theologians talking. That's really intriguing. You should build that. So, like, I'm totally sure that many times along the way of my teenage and early teenage years and early 20s, people had told me to be more constructive. But for whatever reason, that moment was a Kairos moment. And what Yolan said kind of hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Like, if you have this image, this vision, for what something should be, why are you telling other people to do it? You should just build it. And so I'm sitting there and I'm kind of thinking to myself, what would it mean to build it? Like, what would it mean to turn this conference of like 500 people into 500 young people from the four corners of the earth, from all different faiths, talking about how their faiths inspired social action? actually engaging in it, reflecting on it, and doing it again over and over and over, and having this, like, building these castles in my head, and I'm thinking to myself, boy, that sounds, like, super hard, you know? And I'm kind of continuing this reflection process, and this isn't all happening in the moment. I'm sure some of it happened in retrospect. It's all kind of collapsed right now, but I'm kind of wondering to myself, and I'm being, like, you know, very self-revealing here, but I'm kind of wondering to myself, like, is one of the reasons that I'm so self-righteous and dramatic in my call-outs about what other people are doing wrong is because, honestly, it's a little bit of like a smokescreen of like, if I'm really in your face, you will be so offended by what I am doing. You won't say to me the super obvious thing, which is, that's a great idea. You should build it. We built this. This was our idea. You have one. You should build that. So these thoughts are like all kind of going through my head, right? And I'm like liking this notion of myself as somebody who builds something. Because honestly, after a while, like at least for me, entering into a room thinking to myself, I'm going to catalog everything that other people are doing wrong and then get into their face about it. It's kind of getting boring for me, you know? And this other notion kind of hits me, which is, I'm curious, like, if I had requested having breakfast with these folks who were on panels, like, the next morning, and saying, hey, listen, 
you know, you're building theological frameworks for stuff, and I kind of wish you didn't talk so long, but whatever, that's your thing. But I have this other idea. Maybe you could do the theological framework stuff, and I could do the youth program stuff, and we could work together. Did I really think that they were going to say no? And my dad would say to me, like, why are you constantly, like, throwing rocks at the window when you could just walk through the door and sit at the table? And so that moment is honestly the beginning of a whole new life for me. And 25 years later, I am still building that thing that was the seed of an an idea back then. What does it look like to build interfaith initiatives that are more about young people acting, that are more about, that have more of a vanguard energy, that are moving as quickly as possible into a new world? I'm still building that. And I'm still reflecting on why it was I didn't start earlier. And there was this moment in Game of Thrones. People watch Game of Thrones? Okay, so I'm about to make myself just mildly unpopular here. Stick with me. It will get better. I promise you. But there was this moment in Game of Thrones where I was like, oh my gosh, I could have been that person, right? And it's the Daenerys Targaryen character, you'll remember her, right? She's like this righteous warrior for justice. And I loved her. And like, I understood her at this visceral level. She hated injustice. She hated inequality. She hated the idea of marginalization. And she had this superpower, which was dragons, which is kind of an unsubtle metaphor for rage. And she would like ride these dragons into these deeply unjust cities. And she would burn down the structures of the slaveholders. You remember this, right? And then she would become effectively the mayor of the city. And there she is with her dragons, her great superpower. But now there's a little bit of a problem because that's like still her major power, those dragons but they can't tell the difference between a farmer and a slaveholder. They just burn everything down. And so she decides she doesn't really like being in charge. She doesn't really like being a mayor. What she really wants is to rule rule over all of the seven kingdoms. It's not worth being the mayor of one of these provinces. And so she goes city to city, kingdom to kingdom, burning down the structures of the slaveholders right? Leading this kind of charge of when I leave, when I am installed on the Iron Throne, we will usher in this great era of peace and prosperity. And in the final episode, and this is where I'm going to make myself mildly unpopular, in the final episode, she wins. She does what what my friend John Powell challenges social action folks to do. She wins, right? She defeats the ruling family. She burns Cersei to a crisp, and she installs herself on the Iron Throne. And here, her advisors are just elated, right? Finally, the inequality can end. Finally, the injustice can end, right? Like this queen who hates inequality and injustice is now in charge. She's leading. She sits upon the Iron Throne. And do you remember what Daenerys Targaryen, now the queen, said? Let's go find more kingdoms to burn. And I'm watching this and I'm like, oh my gosh, that was the track I was on. Because if most of what you've done is burn things down and then all of a sudden you're in charge, you actually don't have a ton of experience doing that. That's not what you've gotten good at. If most of what you've got is the dragons of rage, That's what you're good at. And so you just keep looking to do it over and over again. And it's not just unpopular endings to HBO miniseries, right? I mean, honestly, I want you to think to yourself, in the history that you know, do the ratio in your mind of Mandela's to Robespierre. Not that many Mandelas. There's a lot more Robespierre. So what does it look like to just build it? To defeat the things we do not love 
by building the things we do. And it actually turns out that there is in, like deep in my bones, a model, the model that I grew up with of a builder. And for me, as an American, a smiley Muslim, that model would be the Prophet Muhammad. May the peace and blessings of God be upon him. So one of the distinguishing features of the Prophet Muhammad, and he shares features with many prophets. This is a core Muslim belief, right? He is the bringer of the message of mercy and monotheism, as many prophets before him were, including Jesus, and Moses, and Abraham, and Noah, and Adam. He is one who calls out the structures of injustice, particularly in the city of Mecca, when he begins his mission in the year 610. But one of the distinguishing features of the Prophet Muhammad is when he is hounded out of Mecca in the year 622, which is the year, incidentally, that the Islamic calendar is dated back to. Okay, that's how important that year is. When he is hounded out of Mecca and he goes to the city of Yathrib, it gets renamed Medina, the city of the Prophet. And in Medina, the Prophet is not principally issuing Jeremiah's against the unjust social order. He's principally building a better system. He starts actually in the home of a rabbi, Rabbi Mukhar. And I love the stories that are at the center of the Muslim tradition of the Prophet Muhammad partnering with rabbis and working to honor the Jewish tradition. They are replete in the Muslim tradition. And one of his first moves in Medina is one of these stories. In the home of Rabbi Mukharif, they have a gathering of the respected elders of the various clans, tribes, and religious groups in Medina. And the Prophet Muhammad says, we have to have a way where everybody can maintain their distinctiveness, clan, tribe, religious group, which included pagans, Christians, Jews, and this growing Muslim community. All of you can maintain your distinctiveness, but we need to come together in common endeavors, which will include our mutual defense, which will include the cleanliness and sanitation of the city, which will include things like irrigation systems. And they penned something called the Constitution of Medina written document which articulates the rights that each individual group has and the manners in which they will cooperate together. One of the earliest articulations of a common loyalty between diverse groups while maintaining distinctiveness. The prophet then appoints a set of people as an assembly who will ensure that the principles of the constitution of Medina, again, pen, written, signed, in the home of a rabbi, ensure that the principles of the constitution of Medina are applied. He also knows that while building a set of principles at 30,000 feet is a very important thing, and having an assembly of people who are custodians of those principles, you have to also build things at a ground level. So he builds a masjid. We think of a masjid principally as a place for Muslim prayer, but the actual translation of the term masjid means a place of ground. And the masjid in Medina, the Prophet's first mosque, had openings on three sides with no doors. Anybody could come in. It was not just a place of Muslim prayer. It was a place of community meeting. It was a place of learning. There were designated areas for study. When a group of Abyssinians came and did dances in the masjid, the prophet encouraged them. When a group of Christians came to argue theology with the prophet about the nature of Jesus, and it was time for their prayer, and they asked for leave of the city so they could go outside of the prophet city to offer their Christian prayer and return to argue theology, the prophet said, no, I want you to pray in the masjid. It is a place of community gathering. He built an institution where people from various tribes and ethnicities and clans could come together and engage one another as a community. The masjid has a tower called a minaret, 
where the call to community gathering is made. The person the prophet appoints as the musin, the one who offers the call, is a non-Meccan, a non-Arab, a former slave, an Abyssinian named Bilal, who spoke Arabic with a thick accent. People of all nations are a part of our community and our leaders in it. The institution of a better social order. The prophet also built markets, a common market where people from all of these clans and tribes who previously only had separate markets, one of the things that maintained hostility between those tribes, built a common market so people could offer and exchange goods and services. It was a way of elevating people's talents. A different model of social change. Come in to an area and ask the question, what does it look like to build the new institutions of a better social order? So this is part of what we do at Interfaith America. We recognize that the great religious traditions of the world actually have an awful lot to offer in terms of models of social change. A huge part of what the Prophet Muhammad is doing in Medina is articulating an ideal and building institutions to accomplish or at least move closer to that ideal. I'm gonna say that again, right? As a model of social change that is at the heart of many religions, Christians would say this is building the kingdom of God on earth. It is social change, not in saying everything that is wrong with the current system and hoping that a better one magically appears. It's social change is saying, I'm going to articulate a better way, a possible ideal, and then we're going to build actual institutions that both instantiate that ideal, however imperfectly, and move our city, our nation, our society closer to it. So listen, we live in the most religiously diverse nation in human history, the most religiously devout nation in the Western Hemisphere, the world's first attempt at religiously diverse democracy. Our diverse religious traditions have to be sources of inspirations to serve, sources of new visions for a better society, bridges of cooperation so that we work on these things together. And this is not new. If you think about it, actually, so many of the ways in which we, in which we articulate American community come from religious traditions. City on a Hill, Cathedral of Humanity, Beloved Community, Better Angels of Our Nature, Almost Chosen People, American Medina. Part of the beauty of a nation that has all of this religious diversity is we get to draw on the wisdom of these variety of religious traditions for these imaginations, these visions, these possibilities. And then the genius of religious traditions is that they build institutions to that ideal. And actually we experience it in American society all the time. We just don't realize it. The second and third largest Infrastructures for social services after the federal government, the Salvation Army, and Catholic Charities. The largest association in the country after AAA, the YMCA, founded as the Young Men's Christian Association. The number of Catholic colleges and universities in the nation, about 230. Virtually all of these institutions, founded by particular religious communities, serve people of all faiths. Anytime you think to yourself that there is tension between different communities, right? I think you know the, uh, a part of the work we've been doing in the Bay Area is about tensions between Muslims and Jews. Anytime you think that there is tension, that is real, but there are a hundred examples of cooperation. What would it look like to pay attention to those examples of cooperation? I'll give you one. Six of the nine refugee resettlement agencies in the United States were founded by religious communities. One of them is called HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. It's founded in the late 19th century at a time when pogroms were replete in Europe. And of course, that continues through the middle of the 20th century. 
But by the 1970s, most of the Jews who want to be resettled have been resettled. Does highest close? No. It uses its Jewish values to start resettling people from other backgrounds. In the 1970s, frequently from Southeast Asia. Today, the majority of people that highest resettles are, anybody want to guess? Muslim. I think that that is the best example of America, the most wonderful possibility. And I also think that it is right there in the holy tradition of Islam. And I promise you, there are a thousand examples between Christians and Buddhists, between Catholics and Hindus of precisely that kind of cooperation. That's what we do at Interfaith America. That's what we do in the field of bridge building. That's why building institutions to these ideals is so important. And that's why I think to myself, and I'll end with this, that nurturing a diverse democracy, which by the way, political philosophers for centuries literally thought was impossible, nurturing a diverse democracy is not just a civic project. It's not just a political project. It is a sacred project. That's the opportunity we all have before us. Thank you.